Well, hi there, everybody. Welcome to the latest edition of the Gary Neville podcast. Gary, much warmer in uh, London on this particular Sunday. Not particularly warmed by the game that we've seen, but for Manchester City, it's another win. It's an extraordinary sequence, and they are doing it um, with, with panache sometimes, but they're doing it with organisation and individual uh, defensive performances you highlighted Ruben Diaz today and John Stones wasn't far behind was he uh, what did you make of this kind of Manchester City win no and I think that if you think back over the years uh, we know that Pep Guardiola's teams are built on possession but they've also when he's been most successful and he has been at many many clubs have had great defensive records and I always remember there was a, there was a Spain stat out of main, uh, major tournaments I think it was something like they hadn't conceded a goal in a knockout game for three tournaments when they won those three tournaments, I think it was mid-2000s, going up to 2010. Um, partly it's because of the possession and the fact that they dominate the game. But I thought Manchester City's weakness last year was that when they were keeping the ball high up the pitch, which they've always done with Pep Guardiola, the problem is that they were allowing teams to cut back through them too easily. But the sustaining attacks again. And I use the word suffocation because the two centre-backs pressing, Cancelo comes inside, Zinchenko comes inside, Fernandino's there, and they've got that block of almost five players, two at the back, three in front, so when Arsenal win it back or any team wins it back, they just haven't got anything to go back through. And they're so aggressive, they're so connected, which means they're good on the ball. And you talk about compact, compact on the ball and compact out of possession as well. It's it's brilliant to watch. It's methodical. Sometimes it can be difficult to watch on a, on a day like today. And sometimes difficult to broadcast on, to be fair. It, it is. It was. And it just got too easy for Manchester. It's almost like I used the sort of Floyd May, Mayweather uh, expression at the end because it was almost like he'd won the first three rounds, got well in front and then just jabbed for the next nine rounds. And sometimes, you know, it, it, it's great, really, because to be able to do that is special. I think you use the term digging in. And I always remember when we played games away from home in the Premier League, many games that we won 1-0. It was always an onslaught in the last 10 minutes. But Pep Guardiola's team win games without there being an onslaught against the goal. And that makes them extremely special. The quality of possession is... And the bravery in their defending is fantastic. And we don't have the kind of footballers in the Premier League that do those onslaughts, do we? <laughs> no. Rough and ready for defenders up from the back and um, big men up front and just pump the ball in. It's not like that now. It's a more sophisticated approach. And Arsenal tried as hard as they could. They, they made a lot of changes. And you were interested in the way Mikel Arteta yeah. approached this game, even with his team selection. Well, the two teams that he picked against Leeds and against Benfica were the same team. So you'd have to say that's going to be his strongest side. So when you change your team for Manchester City, and again, this is where it gets to, I think, when you're looking at prioritising which games you can win, which games I'm going to make, you know, which games I'm going to rotate in. The message would have been sent, I think, loud and clear to his players that, you know, I'm changing it today and my strongest team will be back in again against Benfica. Needed, I think, because I think that you could see there was some tired legs out there for Arsenal, but also certainly sends a message to his players that, this is probably a game we're not going to win even if we play our strongest team, so I just need to maybe rest a few. And I thought that before the game, it was a message that was clearly sent to me and you broadcasting that, uh, I'm not saying Ar Arsenal did not throw this game away by any stretch of the imagination. It, they were professional. I thought they were going to get a good well, pace. They did it in the guise of freshening it up because they did have a, a tough travel schedule. And unfortunately, that's not the fault of football these days. It is what the government say where you can go and where you can't go. And Benfica from Portugal, it's a... It's a difficult country to deal with in terms of the COVID yeah. and, and we have our problems as well for other countries to deal with our teams. Yeah, I, the one thing I would say is though he could have made the five or six changes against Benfica and prioritised the game against Manchester City and not doing that sends the message to your players of what's the most important or what's the one that he feels is going to bring the club greatest success this season which tells you that he's written off his, you know, his chance of getting into that what would be top four which is probably right and I don't think Arsenal will get there but it, it was a... It was a brilliant start from City. Then it became a training game. Then out of it becoming a training game, Arsenal just gained a little bit of confidence because they weren't 3-0 down, I think. And then at half-time, Mikel Arteta says, well, you might as well have a little bit of a goal for it because they're just, they're just drifting through the game. But it just petered out. And that's what City sometimes can do to you. Like I say, when they were at the best a couple of years ago, there were many games that I would watch where you would think the other team don't have a chance. And they're getting back to that standard where it's just very difficult. I think if De Bruyne and Gundogan had been anything like their top sharpness today then I think it would have been 3-0 but they were just a little bit short having not played football in the last couple of weeks and De Bruyne are obviously a little bit longer. Well City continue their sequences Everton ended 
a sequence of uh, the, the whole century. <laughs> Since 1999, they hadn't won at Anfield, and then they did. Uh, what did you make of that? Well, I... I, was, I wasn't put on the, the Merseyside derby by Sky Sports for the first six years out of Manchester United, strategically, I think. And then I was put on, I think, the last uh, three or four years. I've been put on a few of them. And honestly, Everton have been absolutely pathetic in terms of their performance levels, their belief. Um, just absolutely no chance in their heads before they go on the pitch. And yet, yesterday was different. And Liverpool, obviously, are going through a really bad spell. Everton recognised that. I think the idea that sort of Calvert Lewin Richarlison are the type of players uh, Rodriguez obviously played for the first part of the game, but they were always the type of players that were going to cause that backline problems. Um, and Jurgen Klopp at this moment in time isn't really changing anything to do anything about it to protect players. I remember at Manchester United there were times when I played centre back maybe, and you know there were a couple of centre back injuries, and I had to go in there as a makeshift centre back, or Roy Keane did. But maybe then, you know, Phil Neville and John O'Shea might play in midfield. My brother and John O'Shea or Ronnie Johnson and Nicky Butt would play in front. And you'd almost play like a box to protect them, to make sure that the centre-backs couldn't be got at if you were playing against the top team. Against Arsenal, sometimes you'd play Darren Fletcher and Anderson in front. And really, they would be a lot better defensively, say, than, than Paul Scholes, as an example, who obviously wouldn't be as strong defensively as Darren Fletcher. So things like that, I, I think that maybe Liverpool, I've not seen any change. I've not seen any difference in what they do. Um, and Everton picked the right moment. If they weren't going to show belief yesterday, then they never were. And I think they just the system, they got the system right, Carlo Ancelotti. They got the tactics right, and they got an early goal. And they got an early goal. And then obviously from that moment they had something to hang on to. Um, so a brilliant moment for Everton. I think that they would need to see. That there are signs that in certain games under Carlo, Carlo Ancelotti that they do look like they've got more belief in big matches. And that's the one thing that I've always levelled at Everton that they've lacked. Um, that should give them a real feeling, even though quite a few teams are winning at Anfield at the moment, that still should give Everton and those players a real sort of sense of confidence that this can be as good a season as they've had for quite a bit. I couldn't believe it when I looked up the facts before this game. In the February to February, Liverpool had lost 16 matches. Now they've lost 17 matches in more or less a year from the first defeat of that was away to Atletico Madrid and they lost the home game as well. Yeah. They went out in the round of 16, which we're going through in this period. So it's pretty accurate in terms of from then to now. 17 matches in a year, during which time, of course, they, they won the league and all credit to them. Um, have you had any thought about when did you start to see cracks appearing in the, in the fortress? Up until two or three weeks ago, Martin, I had quite I had quite a lot of sympathy, actually, for Liverpool in the sense that we could never go at United that fourth season. And I think I mentioned it on Monday Night Football. Um, I think Jamie was doing a piece on Firmino and said he might be the one in the summer that might have to be changed. And I was of the opinion that this team just looked like it needed resetting and, and a rest. It wasn't a case of sort of, you know, rebuilding by any stretch of the imagination. I still don't think that today. Um, and two or three weeks ago, I said that I felt that, you know, three years of getting to a Champions League final, trying to keep up with an unbelievable Manchester City team, nearly getting to the title in that second season, but winning the Champions League. And then last season, finally doing it, there was always going to be a natural drop off that three years of going full pelt, those same players, exceptional standard, the job that Jurgen Klopp's done, the relief of that 30 year wait for a title. The fans not being in the stadium this year, and I do think that impacts Liverpool maybe more than some other clubs. Um, so for me, I, I just was up to a couple of weeks ago, was a little bit like, well, this is what happens. And I was the same with Pep Guardiola's Manchester City last season. I just felt that, look, they, they'd done so well. The standard was so high, 100 points, 100 goals, year on year. OK, you, you need a little bit of relief from pundits, analysts to say a year off, not a year off, but, you know, a drop, a dip is going to be there. But now it's starting to get a little bit worrying in the sense that, you know, we know we've got injuries, we know the fans aren't in the stadium, we know we've got COVID, we know we've got a lot of games, but it's the same for everybody. It's the lack of change, the lack of what would be um, the idea. They look just look beaten. They're like almost like, I'd use the word zombies on the pitch, just almost like they're walking around, sort of th tr thinking the same it's thing. It's the lack of competition for those who've done so much in getting, bringing all these honours to Liverpool. Yeah, uh, maybe. Maybe there's a little bit of that. I still come back to the point of that fourth year. I still think that's really critical. And maybe now it's just getting worse and worse and it's confidence. But maybe then they need a little bit of something different from Jurgen Klopp, who's been quite simply 
unchallengeable and still is for that matter for what he's done at Liverpool but I think he may be even thinking now well do I have to just do something different and I'm, I've not got any ideas I, I, you know it's not for me to start <laughs> advising Liverpool or Jurgen Klopp what to do but just playing almost like a box and saying like I'm going to protect my centre-backs playing three at the back we saw Everton do that we've seen other teams go to that system at times but it looks to me like they just need a new idea just to give them a little bit of a spark or else it could be a really depressing season for them where they don't qualify for the Champions League I still think they will because I think they'll somehow well, they could win the Champions League of course, yeah couldn't they? they could win yeah. the Champions League you're right and they, those players can get up for it and they've proven they can do it before but it's a little bit more of a worry than it was two or three weeks ago, I think, if you're a Liverpool fan. But I still think, you know, the end of the season coming and resetting and just getting anybody re-energised, although there's the Euros still, obviously, to come. Um, so there isn't going to be a massive rest. But fans back in the stadium, that fourth year is always a challenge. Manchester City needed that year off last year. Um, and they got it. Liverpool won the league comfortably. And maybe this is what it is for Liverpool. Van Dijk returning, obviously, Gomez returning. All these factors will mean that they'll be a more confident Liverpool come the summer. But at the moment, it's, it's desperate for them. And that, that is the sympathy vote, isn't it? Because the two midfield players who have been put in at centre-back and were doing a decent job, Fabinho and Jordan Henderson. Now, that I think Fabinho might be back quite soon, but he's missed some games now. Henderson got injured Yeah, but protect the them. Protect them. I mean, protect them more. You know, they're still pushing up really high. We've seen Manchester City do it today with Diaz and Stones, but Henderson and Fabinho are still pushing up really high. Um, maybe just drop off deep for a game and try something different. I know it's not the DNA of what uh, Jurgen Klopp is or what this Liverpool team is, but at the moment, surely if you've got two central midfield players uh, at centre-back or if you've got two young, untried players at centre-back, you've got to protect them. And you've got the likes of Shakiri in midfield. We know Thiago, obviously, still t he tackles, but he's not as disciplined defensively. So when you see those types of players in midfield, you're certainly not giving them the best protect protection you can give them. So I would just say at something at this moment in time, try something different. They're going to have to because at this moment, you know, they're going to end up a real bad drop-off. A real bad drop-off would be going from Champions League final, Champions League success, winning the title, finishing second the year before that, and then going to fifth or sixth. They can't afford to do that. They still need to get in the Champions League. Liverpool will need that financial might of the Champions League next season, so they either have to win it or get in the top four. Just before we go, I'd like to touch on two games. I know you didn't see too much of them, but West Ham have made progress. It's a very big win for the Hammers fans to beat Spurs in any situation. Yeah. But to do it in these circumstances, for David Moyes to beat Jose Mourinho, it was a thrilling game. Um, and, and the Hammers, who've probably come out on the wrong side of a number of those games in the past, are coming out more on the right side. They've already outstripped last season's performance already. Well, they would be another club that I would have a time, we've all watched lots of times, and would accuse them of lacking belief at moments where they need to have it, or they would sometimes flatter to deceive and you think they're coming. But this is a real... It's actually... A, Rice and Socek in midfield are good. They're, they're a good, good midfield pair. They provide a lot of physical presence. They're good on the ball or good enough on the ball uh, to be able to shift it forward. Antonio up front, he's got goals in him, and, but he's a real threat. Talk to me about uh, Jesse Lingard. Jesse Lingard, who you know well. Four now who scored, who scored a goal today and, and yep. scored two on his debut. Um, what have they got now? They've got and quality. What's the challenge for Jesse now? They've got actually what you would argue is the f makeup of a very good side, which is a strong spine. And then they've got around that Four Niles, Bowen, um, Ben Rama, Lingard, who have got real quality, energy, and can produce a moment to win a match. And that is the basis of a very good football team. Uh, and I have to say that uh, Jesse Lingard was playing for England two years ago. You know, Jesse Lingard's a good player. I think the problem is when you're at Manchester United and you fall into what would be that squad player type uh, situation where you're not quite, you're not a special player. But you're playing for Manchester United and people start to question, well, is he good enough for United? And the sorts of starts to become a stigma around him. Uh, we're actually just a really good player. He's a good player. He's a, you know, if, he was at, if he was at West Ham to start with, you'd be saying, should other clubs be looking at him? Whereas he starts at Manchester United and it goes the other way and people start to think, well, he's not good enough for United. It becomes almost like a negative conversation. And it's not. Jesse Lingard is, is going to have a fantastic football career. He runs forward well. He's got good understanding of the game. Uh, and... David Moyes knew what he was signing. I'm surprised other clubs didn't look at him as well, but he's done well to go to West Ham. And I do think, like you say, they've got two or three real bright sparks around a strong spine, good full-backs. Um, and they're obviously going to have a good season. They are having a good season, West Ham. But, you know, you think about where they're at at this moment in time. I wouldn't have expected it at the start of this season, 
but you can see why having watched them a little bit more and the more you watch them you think actually yeah I can see why they are doing it they've got that real sort of what would be look of a good side and, and David Moyes will be probably thinking this is the best side that he's had in some ways in consistency terms I know he's at United for that eight months but I'm going to dismiss that you know that's probably the best side he's had you know similar to what the Everton spine that he had where he had Jaggy Elker and Cahill and Les Scott you know that sort of real good experience but then he had some talent around it as well Leicester, you came up here with the Leicester game going on and I've been watching a bit and I said they're two up and you said to me, that's what Leicester can do to you. I said Villa, Villa played could have well. had two or three of themselves yeah. played well and you said that's what Leicester can do to you. What did you mean by that? Well, Leicester, they're a team that can let the other... The, the, the opposition, they can play, but they can also allow the other team to have possession and they can sort of sit back in the game. And they've still got what would be that sort of four or five years ago threat of Jamie Vardy on the counter-attack and with others now as well. It was Mares, obviously, we've watched today. And they've still got that in the game, even though I think they can play some good football through their creative players. Uh, and Leicester, he's doing a brilliant job there, Brendan Rodgers. The big question for Leicester will be, can they hang in there this year? We saw them, I think, were you at... The, uh, were you at um, the King Power on the last day of the last season last year, yeah, against yeah. Manchester United, where if they'd have beat Manchester United, they would have gone into the top four. They're going to be in a similar position, I feel, whereby it's going to be tight at the end. There are going to be teams hunting them down, Chelsea, Liverpool, Manchester United. I think City will win the title. So you think about Leicester, Chelsea, Liverpool um, and Manchester United, there's going to be one of those teams misses out. And for Brendan Rodgers this year, massive success would be just edging into that top four ahead of one of those big teams that have invested a lot of money. And I think that he would be saying at this moment in time, this is the step further. They just fell short last year. They had a really bad end to the season where they just started to drop points. And it wouldn't surprise me if it happened again, but then we'll know whether this team progressed. And that won't just be about their form. It'll be about, did they pick up a couple of injuries because they don't have the depth of the other squads. But I think they can hang in there if they keep their players fit because it's the type of season whereby... You know, they'll have a few free weeks where others won't and they'll be a bit more concentrated on one thing. Well, they're still in the Europa League, so... Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. But... <laughs> I've forgotten that. <laughs> I, I, just something, I switched off on a Thursday. There's that much football every single week. I think I don't even know who's playing in the Europa League. Tottenham are still in the Europa League as well, aren't they? Well, they need to get out of that Europa League, <laughs> Leicester. I think Brendan Rodgers will, will, will certainly realise that finishing in the top four is the glory for this season. And I think that the Europa League will come, to, I think, a second uh, second fiddle. Well, we must say to everybody, we're watching, um, we're talking about games we've seen. Manchester United haven't played Newcastle and you're in a hurry to get there to watch it. Not not to Manchester, but somewhere no. near a television screen. Yeah, so, no, I, I just feel like it's a, it's a big... Look, Manchester United have been pretty bad in this last couple of weeks in terms of Sheffield United and West Brom. So the teams down at the bottom have caused them some problems. But I just feel if they're going to make... A progression for Manchester United this season is to finish second now, obviously. But I think to be conclusive in doing that, rather than just, if you like, get caught up in a top four race. And I think games like tonight are going to be really, really important with the fact that Liverpool are dropping points at this moment in time. Tottenham have dropped points. Chelsea dropped points yesterday. So I think this is a big one tonight in terms of whether Manchester United can be more conclusive around their top four hopes. And I'm certainly not relaxed, it's too far to go. But games like tonight, they can't keep dropping points against the bottom teams in the league. And Newcastle and Brucey, I'm sure, will be up for it. So I'm uh, I am going to race back into a hotel in London and see whether I can catch that game and understand whether my... Uh, Sunday evening will be as good as my Saturday evening was. Well, you're applying the principle of Jamie Carragher, who's already written off the title, that that's Manchester City. What we've seen today may only add to his argument, uh, but it's going to be a heck of a race for second if that is indeed the case. And Gary, thanks for your time. Get off and Thank you. watch your boys. And uh, thanks again for the podcast. Thank you.